Sorry, we are on Facebook right now, eh? okay? Okay. Okay, very yes. good, Matthew. Thank you so much. I want to introduce you to the audience. Uh, if you follow me, Matthew. Okay, I'm going to introduce you to the audience. I'm going to speak, okay. I'm going to speak in Spanish for a while. Buenas, That's okay. Buenas noches a todos. Gracias por sintonizarnos y por estar aquí con nosotros una vez más en un webinario de la Asociación Mexicana en Ultrasonografía Crítica y Urgencias con su unidad de entrenamiento en la ciudad de Guadalajara, Jalisco, México. Estamos muy contentos de transmitirles y compartirles una conferencia en línea muy interesante. En esta ocasión eh, tenemos al doctor Matthew Captain desde Loma Linda, eh, Los Ángeles, California. Él es médico nefrólogo y justamente, como ustedes saben, el, el doctor Matt pues es un gran entusiasta del ultrasonido Point of Care y ha incorporado en su práctica clínica el uso del ultrasonido. Eh, como ustedes saben, bueno, cada día más médicos, no necesariamente radiólogos y aún más no necesariamente eh, urgenciólogos, intensivistas, neumólogos, etcétera, están utilizando el ultrasonido Point of Care, sino también eh, los cardiólogos, los, los nefrólogos le han encontrado una gran utilidad a esta poderosa herramienta y es por eso que estamos muy contentos de, de, de que el doctor Matthew Captain haya aceptado nuestra invitación para compartirles esta conferencia precisamente sobre el uso del ultrasonido Point of Care enfocado para nefrólogos, el cómo el nefrólogo puede incorporando esta herramienta mejorar su práctica clínica. Así es que bienvenidos sean todos ustedes desde México a todos nuestros amigos que nos están viendo en Facebook Live o aquí mismo en la plataforma, les damos la bienvenida. Eh, ojalá nos puedan decir desde dónde nos están escuchando, desde dónde nos están viendo. Saben, ya, ya saben que pueden hacer ustedes sus comentarios, sus preguntas, los que están en la plataforma, simplemente en el chat pueden escribir lo que, lo, eh, la pregunta que tengan. Igualmente los que están en Facebook pueden hacer sus preguntas ahí mismo en el chat para tratar de, de contestarlas junto con el doctor Matthew. Así que Bienvenido, sea. Vamos a dar la bienvenida al doctor Matthew. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you for accepting this invitation. We are honored. Thank you for being part of this webinar. And let's get started with your conference, Matthew. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So we're going to talk today about how we can use point of care ultrasound in nephrology care in a focused and useful way. What it really helps us with is pre-renal and post-renal. First, we're going to talk about what we do in pre-renal. So the goal here is to optimize intravascular volume. Patients have complications, whether either volume depleted or volume overloaded. We're trying to maximize cardiac output, maximize tissue perfusion, hopefully, in the ICU, and also hopefully write smarter dialysis prescriptions and avoid intradialytic hypotension. So the challenge. There's a need for techniques to differentiate who's most likely to benefit from volume expansion versus vasopressors or maybe inotropes, but not necessarily volume, or volume removal by either diuresis or ultrafiltration. The problem, especially in hospitalized patients, is that there is a mismatch between intravascular volume and extravascular volume, or between the blood pressure and the intravascular volume, because these patients are not in steady state, they're sick. So a lot of the assumptions that we have, we need to throw out the window. We need to realize that the patients can have a low blood pressure, but a high intravascular volume in cases like cardiac dysfunction, cardiac shock, or when you have vasodilation with distributive shock, and then you give them volume again. Similarly, patients can have a very high blood pressure, but very low intravascular volume. Very common in Los Angeles County Hospital where I train, stimulants like cocaine and methamphetamines. So you realize that High blood pressure does not necessarily mean salt and volume overload. Low blood pressure does not necessarily mean that you burst the patient in the ICU. Patients can also have mismatch between the intravascular and the extravascular volume. For example, you can have patients who vasodilate, third space. People who have sepsis or anaphylaxis. You can also have delayed reequilibration. For example, when you start with a volume overloaded patient, say in heart failure or with nephrotic syndrome, and then you diurese them and they become intravascularly volume depleted. You can also have patients who are intravascularly volume overloaded, but they haven't yet manifested these signs externally. For example, patients who get rapid blood transfusions, especially if they're aneuric, 
or patients who might get rapid infusion of hypertonic sodium bicarbonate. So you have to realize that sometimes physical exam is not necessarily reliable in the way we hope it might be. A lot of the signs either have high sensitivity with low specificity or, low spe or vice versa. So when we're assessing intravascular volume, there are many different kind of places in the circuit of flow through the blood in the body. You can look at things like the venous part, the arteries, the lung circuit in different ways. Traditionally, we use things like chest x-ray, but there are problems because you might have opacities, a white looking chest x-ray, but there are many reasons, including pneumonia, which might have nothing to do with volume. You have things like lung ultrasound, which tell you a lot of the same information about a chest x-ray and maybe more rapidly and maybe even more accurately, but it's information of a similar type. Now, when you want to look at the volume, the problem though is that the lung, it's kind of a third space as well. If you're overloaded, you might spill into it, but that's not necessarily what that means. When you're looking at the heart, you can look at the cardiac contractility, see how is it squeezing. You can do that through echocardiography. You can also do something like a Swan-Gans catheter. So look at cardiac output through thermal dilution or find systemic vascular resistance in the capillaries. You can look at things like blood pressure and heart rate, your vital signs. And you can look at things that are basically high-tech versions of pulses paradoxus, things like stroke volume variation or systolic blood pressure variation based on the arterial line waveform. You can also look at the venous side of the circuit. You can look at things like the jugular venous pressure, either measured by catheters um, or perhaps estimated by something like IVC diameter and variation. Now, my intuition tells me that looking at the venous side of the circuit kind of tells you, where are you? What do you need to do? And the arterial side of the circuit, when you look at it, kind of tells you, well, how did I do? Did I improve the patient? But side. What are we going to do with ultrasound? Well, with a limited in cardiac IVC ultrasound, you can look at the heart for either contractility. You can look and see, yes or no, is there a pericardial effusion? Yes, no. Is there obvious cardiac tamponade? Or maybe right heart strain? You can look at the IVC and the long axis. Look at the diameters and the collapsibility over either the respiratory or the ventilatory cycle. And this tells you about pre-renal. So... Often I like to use that subcostal landmark. And these are some of your um, landmarks. Now, when I learned about heart anatomy, they told me, put your heart in front of your hands. All right, this is your right ventricle. This is your right atrium. This is your left ventricle. This is your left atrium. Put it right in your chest like this. So you can imagine when you're looking through the chest with the ultrasound, the right ventricle is always on top. And there you have right ventricle on top. So this is a normal heart, I would hope. It's my heart. And you can see how the landmarks look with a substernal. Now this is a patient who had severe heart failure. And I also am a little bit off in my axis because the heart is very large. So we can call this a five chamber view. You also get a look at the aortic valve outlet. This patient has severe dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure. And even without being a trained sonographer, you can see that that heart is contracting very weakly. This is somebody who we happened to just see on rounds in the ICU, and we were the first to notice that he was in cardiac tamponade because we were just checking systematically. This is the kind of thing that you'd want to know before you dialyze somebody. So again, looking at the heart tells you about pre-renal. The heart and the kidneys, or the heart and the dialysis machine, have to work as a team. Now, the next thing you do is you can look at the inferior vena cava, collapsibility and size to tell you about the venous side of the circuit, the intravascular volume. What we do is we look just to the right of the midline. The IVC is measured about two centimeters from the outlet of the hepatic vein. And we use something called the collapsibility index, which is the maximum diameter minus the minimum diameter normalized by dividing the maximum diameter. And we do this in both spontaneously breathing and mechanically ventilated patients. So this is kind of the principle that you're looking at. In a fluid responsive patient, you're going to have a big change in the diameters over the respiratory cycle. And this reflects that you have change in the working right atrial pressure over the cardiac outflow curve, Guyton principle. Whereas in somebody who's already overloaded, 
they may have change in the pressure, but it's past where you change your working values. And so you don't get this change in your pressures. You're way off the scale. So this is a little subtlety, but it's important because a lot of literature reports the data differently. In patients who are breathing spontaneously up here, when you breathe in, it's through negative inspiratory force and you create negative intrathoracic pressure. And so you can imagine that you sort of suck blood forward into the heart and so then you collapse the vena cava behind it. Whereas in somebody who's positively ventilated, you can imagine that the air is blown into the chest and kind of crushes the heart. And so it makes the vena cava sort of back up behind it. And so in each case, the literature tends to take the IBC maximum diameter minus the minimum diameter and normalize by the end expiratory diameter. The problem is that in the spontaneously breathing patient, the end expiratory diameter is the maximum IBC diameter, whereas in the mechanically ventilated patient, it's the minimum diameter. And so you get two indices, one that's been called the collapsibility index, and one that's called the distensibility index. Luckily, with algebra, you can convert one into the other. And so keep this in mind when you're looking through the literature. In our case, for the sake of ease, because mostly because it's a variable bounded by zero and one rather than zero and infinity, we decided to use collapsibility index for all patients. So these are some examples of what an inferior vena cava might look like across a spectrum of different patients. This is an extremely volume overloaded patient. You can see by the tick marks on the side that the diameter is three centimeters or greater, and that's much greater than a sort of cutoff of two or 2.1 centimeters that's often used to say IBC maximum diameter might indicate increased intravascular volume. The other thing to notice is that the hepatic vein here is very dilated. And when you have the dilated hepatic vein, that's sort of one of the maximal signs of volume overload. Just to look at some of the landmarks, this is the inlet of the right atrium, this is the hepatic vein, and this is the inferior vena cava. This is also another hepatic vein. Now, in this picture, this patient is more euvolemic. You can see that the IVC maximum diameter is between one and two centimeters. You can see that there is some, but not too much collapsibility over the respiratory cycle. This patient's pretty euvolemic. And here again, you know that this is an IVC because there's nice thin walls. You can see it goes straight into the right atrium. <clears throat> and here you can see another hepatic vein near it. This patient is starting to get a little bit more volume depleted. Here the maximum diameter is still somewhat large, but you can see that it collapses a lot. And again, here now you can appreciate that the hepatic vein is thin and skinny. And that starts to be a sign that you might be more volume depleted as well. And then here's the inlet of the right atrium. Now, this patient might be even more volume depleted because they have an IVC diameter that's small and also collapsing. Some of these patients, they get so small that the IVC hardly opens up at all. You can not even really see the hepatic veins. Sometimes the vena cava is very hard to see at all in a patient like this. But you have to keep in mind, here's the aorta. And so if you can only see one vessel in the chest, chances are you're looking at the aorta rather than the inferior vena cava. Now this brings home the principle that looking at the IVC collapsibility, it's really most useful at the extremes. I'm showing you a little bit of data here from a paper that I have um, just about, it's been accepted for publication in the International Journal of Nephrology and Renovascular Disease, which is open access. Oh, by the way, just about everything that I'm sharing with you today is also in my other article, Focus Ultrasound for Nephrologists, published in the International Journal of Nephrology, which is open access as well. This is a study that we did. It's observational, sort of retrospective, at Los Angeles County over the course of a few years where we took all patients on our service that needed renal consults in the ICU. We ultrasounded them as we thought we needed to for clinical purposes. And then a subset of these patients needed to be dialyzed within the next 24 hours. Those were the subjects for our study. And so what we did is we looked at, well, how much ultrafiltration was actually achieved? Because that's a way to test your predictions, perhaps, about the intravascular volume. And so what you can see here is that there's a very strong correlation of the proportion of success for achieving different 
degrees of intravascular volume. And each time it's a binary yes, no answer. Did you get more than half a liter? Did you take more than a liter? Did you remove more than a liter and a half? Did you remove more than two liters? And of course, successively, as you try to take out more volume, you're going to get a lower chance of succeeding uh, of getting to that goal within the same data set. But you can see that also this principle holds true, varying the cutoff point. And you can see that these people that have, say, like 0 to 5% collapsibility have very high probabilities of being able to remove the volume, whereas people who had very high degree of collapsibility, or these people were also so collapsed that the IVC was just tiny, like I showed you. These patients had much lower chance of being able to achieve a certain degree of ultrafiltration. But sometimes we thought we had to try because they had ARDS or something like that. And these data points represent, they're weighted against the N. So this is number of patients in a category between 0 to 5%, 5 to 10%, 10 to 15%, and so on. Now, the other thing that we can do is use logistic regression to tell us what is the probability in this population of achieving a given ultrafiltration. And you can do this as a continuous variable across the range of probabilities. It's a very different statistical method, but you can see that these curves can almost be superimposed upon each other. So you slice the data in different ways, and you get a very similar result, even though it's noisy ICU data. So that's pretty encouraging. Now, this is a follow-up study that we did. A certain subset of those patients who had ultrasounds and were also then dialyzed had swan dance catheters, about a tenth of them. And in those patients, we could look at the cardiac output before and after a dialysis session, and also look at how much we removed with dialysis. And we found something that's very interesting. Even though these are very ill patients in the ICU, a certain subset of them actually improved their cardiac output significantly with just the right amount of volume removal, which in these patients seem to be between about you know, one to two liters. Most of this is happening in the subset of patients who have less than 10% collapsibility index, which seem to be the natural breakpoint in this data set. By the way, for the previous study, it seemed to be about 20% that maximized sensitivity and specificity between differentiating who could or could not remove a given amount of volume. So slightly different breakpoints and slightly different data set. But in this overloaded patient, you can, in this overloaded population, you see a data that can sort of tell a story. This almost looks like the Starling curve. You can imagine that these patients at point A were volume overloaded, and you remove just the right amount of volume, and you push them up on the Starling curve by unloading them. These patients in D, well, these are patients, we don't have many data points for this, but this idea is validated in other studies where if you give volume to somebody who's volume depleted, you can raise where they are on the Starling curve and improve their cardiac output. These patients over in C, that may actually only be one data point as we're looking at this more carefully for publication. But perhaps there are non-Starling phenomenon, things like cardiac stunning, that might decrease the cardiac output even though you didn't remove much volume. Over here in F, this is sort of the middle of the field. And you have to imagine that sometimes, even if a patient is pretty euvolemic, you've got to remove some volume because they're going to get drips, maybe tube feeds, and there's sort of the cycle of emptying and filling with dialysis in aneuric patients. Nonetheless, if somebody is pretty optimal, it's hard to get more optimal than optimal. And so when you're looking at a change in cardiac output as a percentage, you might imagine there would be a valley in this data set. And that's what you kind of see around F. And these patients on E, they're already volume depleted. And when we tried to remove more volume from them, we decrease their cardiac output. And so this is a story that's very consistent with this idea of a two-sided Starling curve, where very frequently our patients in the ICU are so volume overloaded that when we take volume out, even though they're on multiple pressors, you can see that they slowly come off of their pressors and de-escalate how sick they are. You know, I've seen it many, many times. I know it's real. So, what about the clinical utility of ultrasound? One of the things that you can do with bedside ultrasound, once you put together looking at the heart for contractility and the inferior vena cava, you can differentiate the classic shock states. For example, hypovolemic shock. This is, you would see a hypercontractile heart with small chamber and flat IVC. In distributive shock, again, you might see the hypercontractile heart, but then you might see a flat IVC despite edema. And you can see, then, excuse me.
you can see in cardiogenic shock that you might have the dilated hypocontractile heart and the IVC distended because fluid is backed up, or the blood rather. And then an obstructive, say like a pulmonary embolism, you might appreciate something like a dilated right ventricle, or you might see something like cardiac tamponade. And so this is very powerful because one of the things that people use the Swan-Gans catheter for is to answer the question, what kind of shock is my patient in? You can do this non-invasively in the emergency room, on the ward, in the ICU. So there's the idea, but how did it test out? In a prospective study, using this rush exam, which includes this plus a little bit more, they had an overall sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 96% compared to using the final shock, di the final shock diagnosis by chart review. And so these are very good assessment tools. So what do I think is the clinical utility of this? Well, you can eliminate one possibility. You know, if you see that a patient looks, you can say, I know that that patient's not hypovolemic, or I know that that patient's not hypervolemic. You might have findings that are in the middle. Some patients are in the middle. And I'll tell you a secret. If the patient's in the middle clinically, what are you going to do? Whatever you were going to do anyways before you decided to check with an ultrasound. You can also differentiate the types of acute renal failure. You can look at things like pre-renal or cardio-renal, because remember, pre-renal is just poor kidney perfusion, and you can do that because of either severe volume depletion or very poor perfusion with volume overload and heart failure. You can also look at post-renal. You can look at things like, is, do you have obstruction, large bladder, hydronephrosis? You can differentiate the types of shock. You can effectively manage hypo and hypernatremia, because to manage hypernatremia and hyponatremia, you need to manage the intravascular volume, where all of the sensors are that affect the hormones. They don't see edema space. You might have to manage differently. If there's mismatch between the intravascular and the extravascular volume, know that in this case, you need to mobilize edema so that you can then take it out with diuretics or ultrafiltration. You can guide ongoing volume management with hemodialysis. Many times I've said, that man is volume overloaded, and he is so volume overloaded that I will not be able to do this work in a day. So I know that I'm going to do a daily dialysis, take out a large amount of volume, but I can't do this forever. One of these days, he's going to crash and burn. What I've found is that if you look every day with an ultrasound, it's an earlier warning. The vital signs changes in the middle of a dialysis session that maybe it's time to back off, slow down. And you can use repeated evaluations to guide any kind of ongoing management. Even if you have a patient who's in septic shock, you can give him a reader or two. Check his vena cava and his heart again. See, you know, see, does he still look volume depleted? You might need to give some more. I remember one time in training, I had a young man in severe sepsis. We gave nine liters of saline in an evening based on that. The next morning, he had mild crackles. He did very well in the end. But that's because his volume management was guided to his intravascular euvolemia, not some recipe that says patients on average do things like this. So, but there are conditions that bias IVC ultrasound findings, and you have to be aware of these clinical factors when you're evaluating a patient in context. This is a summary of conditions that might cause you to overestimate the intravascular volume. Something like cardiac tamponade, remember, you might back up the heart. So your collapsibility index might be decreased and your maximum is increased. And by the way, if you look at my manuscript, you can find the references where we filled out for this table. Something like severe valvular stenosis, like aortic stenosis, same deal. Massive pulmonary embolism. Again, you get this right ventricular strain and larger IVC maximum. Or maybe if you have a right ventricular MI. But the trick for all of these conditions is that they're all preload dependent. And so you might find a patient who has this clinical condition and you see that their IVC is still collapsed and you go, oh my goodness, I know that's real and I know that I need to give that patient volume right away. Or you might say a patient like that and they're very volume overloaded and they look like they're having trouble breathing and you see that the IVC is distended and you know, well, clinically I know I've got to remove some volume. But if I keep checking, maybe again, I'll see a change in the vena cava before I see a change in the vital signs. Maybe you have something like severe tricuspid regurgitation. Maybe you have something like high PEEP. Now, we found a study that shows that there's no difference between a PEEP of zero and a PEEP of five. Decreased tidal volume, and so on. 
Now, decreased inspiratory effort in shallow breathing. Again, you see, again, a patient who is like this, if they look like they're volume depleted, you know it's real. If they look for, eh, maybe it's in question. But all of these conditions have a systematic direction for bias. And you have to remember, so it's not just, oh, you can't use it, it's interpret in context. All right, here are some conditions that under, might cause you to underestimate intravascular volume. Same as low tidal volume or inspiratory effort, maybe high tidal volume or inspiratory effort. And when it's inspiratory effort, like when a patient is really belly breathing, maybe part of it is that they're knocking your probe out of the way and that you're not cutting the cylinder right down the center anymore. But maybe it's also due to the pressures and changes physiologically. Maybe if the patient is grunting because they're in pain or uncomfortable and they're doing Valsalva. Or maybe if they have intra-abdominal hypertension. This is again one where if you see that the vena cava is still large and full, that's kind of like the garden hose that you can't crush even though you're stepping on it because the pressure is very high. You know it's real. If it looks small, eh, maybe you don't know. Then there are things that are factors that just limit visualization in any patient. Morbid obesity. But it's not as bad as you think because you don't actually have that much fat right at your sternum. Things like abdominal pain, that can be really hard, but sometimes you can cheat and just go over the rib a little bit. Bowel gas, that's an enemy anytime. Surgical dressings, sometimes you only have one square inch and you just have to take the spot that you have. And you know, with ultrasound, it's sort of like well, a video game. You know, I thank goodness I grew up playing them. At first, you're not very good, but with practice, you get better and better. And the things that used to be impossible are now just the tricky ones. And as you get better, you expand your repertoire. Things like subcutaneous emphysema, though, you can't see through gas. But you know what? Sometimes that's a powerful diagnostic. I have had more than one morning where I woke up, did an exam like that on somebody in the ICU, said something is not right, they need an abdominal CT, and found something that needed to be found. Talcum powder. This is a pro tip for you. If the patient has talc on the belly, take a wet cloth, wipe it all off. Because if you get that in your ultrasound gel, it just looks like a snowstorm. And here's expanding your repertoire. So if looking at the subcostal view doesn't do it for you, you can actually go any place along the costal margin, all the way to the mid-axillary view, which is the surgeon's way of doing it, since they so frequently open the belly. If you're trying to look at the heart and you can't see, you can also look at the parasternal long and short axes. You can look at the apical four-chamber view. If you're trying to see the vena cava and you just can't, something that we've considered and we had to put in our review was looking at the subclavian veins. Now we did this in a cohort at Los Angeles County as a pilot and found that there's actually reasonable correlation in the patients who are ventilated, but very poor correlation in the patients who are spontaneously breathing. One of the other interesting differences that I've found, but haven't collected the data on yet, are that we've found a patient, a paper that we've cited that shows that there's no clinical difference in looking at the IVC collapsibility and diameter between patients at 45 degrees and supine, but there is a huge difference looking at the subclavian vein. That's very similar to looking at the jugular vein that we learned in medical school. When you sit up, it looks empty. When you lay it down, you can see it go way higher. So that's very position dependent. And I imagine that if you're ever going to try to use this, you're going to have to standardize on something like 30 degrees because that's ICU height or something. Anyways. So now to review. Assessment of intravascular volume. We've just talked about how the ultrasound is a very powerful tool for looking at both the heart and the venous side of the circuit. Another thing that you can do is use ultrasound for the long part of the circuit. And a lot of my colleagues who teach this ultrasound at um, conference, who also do volume assessment, use the lung. And there's a reason for this. There's a lot of literature supporting it, and it's much more uniform in the support, and it's very protocolized. You know, you look at your lung in your four quadrants on each side, you look, see how many rockets might there be, you count them, the frequency, you can do statistical analysis, it lends itself very well to research, and it looks like it's stacking very favorably against doing chest x-rays. And the interesting thing about lung ultrasound is that it exploits the, diff the artifact in ultrasound rather than looking at structures. So you can see that you get a certain set of artifacts with normal healthy lung tissue that are reverberation, and they call this A-lines. You get a different set of 
artifact when you have thickened intralobular septa. They look like what they call bee lines or comets or rockets. And these, well, you can tell what's a rocket because they call it the comet tail artifact. It's hyperechoic, meaning that it's light. It's well-defined, laser-like. It arises from the pleural surface, which is here, easier to see in video. And it spreads out without fanning or fading. It doesn't get wider at the base. And it goes right through those reverberation artifacts, obliterates the A-lines. Lung ultrasound, again, looks at the lung part of the circuit, which I think is more like a third space. And a lot of times as nephrologists, we need to know about the intravascular volume. But looking at everything together is always more data, better physical exam. Another thing that we need to do as nephrologists, of course, is look at the bladder and the kidneys, host renal and renal. So the suprapubic position, it's very important for assessing bladder volume. Many patients with diabetes, even women, have urinary retention because of neurogenic bladders. Many furries are placed poorly in the hospital. And as nephrologists looking at AKI, it comes up more often than you'd think. It's important to look for. The kidneys, you don't have to be an expert sonographer. You can start by trying to answer basic yes-no questions like, is there hydronephrosis? Do you see cysts? You know, what is the kidney size? And then that can tell you a lot, like large kidney with many cysts, maybe polycystic kidney disease. Small kidney, few cysts, chronic kidney disease. So looking at the bladder, again, at this position. And what you have to do is take two axes. So first, one up and down, one side to side, rotate 90 degrees, another side to side. You take your three diameters and you multiply them by the magic factor, which is 0.2 if you're going to use the volume of an ellipsoid, or 0.57 if you believe these people who decided to do statistical correlation of estimated bladder volume by ultrasound versus um, catheter residual volumes. So the truth is somewhere in between. 0.52 increases the sensitivity of your exam, perhaps. Anyways, very simple to do, and you can find important things. For example, this is a patient whose Foley catheter was placed outside of the bladder. So jump through the tracks in the urethra. You know, I had to call urology. They tell me, we placed it under cystoscopy. I had to tell them, please try again. You know, this patient was in the ICU, and his nurse feels terrible about it to this day. But he was agitated, and they had him in restraints for agitation. And what happens? We found that his Foley balloon was inflated in his prostate. I have to say that I would be agitated too. This is an example of somebody who has a bladder that's full of blood and the blood is coagulated. So now it's light colored because it's solid and you can still see the Foley bulb. And then here's the tip of the Foley catheter. This patient has the Foley bulb properly inserted, but you can see that there's urine co collecting around it in the bladder. And you can actually see here the insert of the ureters on each side. This is the Foley and then the tip. This Foley catheter is not draining. It's either clogged or kinked or something. It's in the right spot, but it's not working. I throw in this last picture because it's kind of a look-alike, and it teaches a lesson. You know, with ascites, it's very hard to tell the difference between ascites fluid and bladder fluid because usually, unless there's inflammation of the bladder, the wall is so thin you can't tell the difference between fluid on one side and the other. But here, this patient had minimal ascites, and when you aim down at the pelvic gutter, you can see a little collection of fluid and a little bit of rectum, and you might almost mistake that for a Foley bulb. Nope, that's just a patient with ascites. You have to check. And remember also, if you have a patient with ascites and you can't tell what's the bladder volume with an ultrasound with pictures, the bladder scan machine is useless. Now onto the kidneys. These views, again, were adapted from the literature for the uh, rap rush exam, rapid ultrasound and shock. And so for these people, um, you can use the same ultrasound views that you use in the rush exam to also, they're perfect views for the kidney. And so just to show you, these are the landmarks on the body, and then these are the pictures that you get from those respective landmarks. The orientation's a little non-standard, but to show you anatomy. So the spine is in the middle, kind of, to orient yourself. So this is going from the patient's right side, and you can see the liver. You can see this line here that delineates. This is the diaphragm and it separates the liver from the lung on top. And then this is the right kidney. And you can see the difference between the cortex and the medulla. And you can also look at the echogenicity. You can see that this kidney is darker than the liver, which is normal. If the kidney looks lighter than the liver, perhaps tells you about chronicity of disease. 
you can look at things again, like are, are these small kidneys? Do they have scarring, which is difference in the cortical thickness, or is it uniform? You know, and this can tell you perhaps about chronicity of renal disease. You could also see is there hydronephrosis? And the nice thing about this view is you can do it on a supine patient, even who's intubated, even though it's a little tricky. And remember, you have to get up high in between the ribs. This is the right kidney. The right kidney is a little harder because the spleen is a smaller ultrasound window than the liver, which is a nice big ultrasound window. You often have to go through two different intracostal spaces to see the entire left kidney. So here again, you have the spleen, you have the diaphragm separating the lung, and here's part of the spine. And then here you have the left kidney, and you can see that it's obliterated by this artifact, which is rib shadowing. Remember, ultrasound can't go through bone, so all that gets reflected back, and then what's behind it? Well, it sees less, so it looks dark. Then when you have the kidney, this is the right kidney, you can look at the long and the short axis, and you can also fan, which is rocking with your hand like this, up and down, to look through the length of the kidney in both sides. You can measure the maximum kidney length. And you can look for pathology. This is an example of very severe hydronephrosis that we had in a patient in LA County. But in this view, you're actually looking from the back. Now, if you have a patient who's ambulatory and you're having trouble seeing the kidney, you can have them sit up and do something like the kidney biopsy view, you might call it. And that's very easy because the kidneys are right up there as long as you go high enough. And you can see the difference between severe hydronephrosis and a normal kidney. More subtle findings. You're always going to be sending this patient to the radiologist for confirmation if you suspect pathology. You know, we're not taking from them. And so anyways, that's a summary of how you can use um, ultrasound in a focused way for a nephrologist that I found to be very high yield and useful. Uh, I'd like to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matthew. Thank you. It's a very, very nice presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to speak in Spanish, uh, Matthew. Bueno, eh, eh, no sé si tengan alguna, alguna pregunta. Estamos muy contentos, muy agradecidos con el doctor Matthew. Como ustedes pueden ver, eh, nos ha, ha explicado realmente de una manera extraordinaria cómo el nefrólogo, utilizando esta poderosa herramienta, puede, hacer, eh, puede mejorar su práctica clínica a un lado del paciente. El mismo, el mismo médico eh, que que está tratando al paciente y que está haciendo las intervenciones, puede eh, diagnosticar, puede detectar eh, situaciones que requieren una atención inmediata y el doctor Matthew nos ha explicado extraordinariamente. Tenemos al doctor Rogelio Monreal y también tenemos, en un momento, eh, Rogelio, voy a, voy a darte audio. Voy primero a hacer la, la pregunta al doctor que nos hicieron en un principio, y en lo que nos comentan el doctor Miguel eh, sobre el índice de colapso de vena yugular en el paciente ventilado, si es igual de fidedigna que el, indi, que el índice de colapsabilidad de la vena cava inferior. Es decir, el doctor está preguntando sobre el paciente, me imagino, eh, que está detectando el estado hídrico, si es igual de efectiva hacerlo a través de la yugular o a través de la vena cava. Matthew, there is one person who is wondering if, uh, if the jugular assessment, in order to evaluate the, the volume status or the volume overload of the nephrology patients, uh, do you consider what is the best method? I mean, uh, evaluating the jugular is similar to evaluating the, the inferior cava vein, in your opinion, Matthew? Well, it's absolutely the same principle. And what I sometimes tell my students is this is looking at like a high-tech jugular venous distension. But I think that when you look at the central vein, you get a little bit better data. Clinically, I'll tell you some problems that I have with JVD. One of the first ones is that I have ICU patients, and so sometimes they have a catheter in each vein. And there goes your ability to assess JVD. Another possibility might be that frequently, I've even seen where a cardiology attending has come in and looked at a patient who had a white-looking chest x-ray, who had edema in the legs, and said, look, I see that's his JVD, he's volume overloaded, kind of walk away, and then I come and do my ultrasound and see that his inferior vena cava is completely collapsed, and I have to wonder, did even this cardiologist mistake the jugular vein for the carotid artery? It can happen. Right. So, you know, there, it's the same principle, but I think that this is a more reliable way of detecting it. 
Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Eh, le voy a dar audio al doctor Rogelio Monreal. Eh, Ro, eh, Rogelio, si gustas, puedes hacer tu pregunta en tiempo real. Puedes eh, en este momento hablar. Si me escuchas, Rogelio. ¿Me escuchas, Rogelio? Puedes hablar. Si tú gustas, puedes hablar. En este momento tienes audio. No, parece que, parece que no. Eh, déjame ver. Eh, bueno, estamos... Eh, Rogelio, si gustas hablar. Ok, bueno, no, no, parece que no, no, ya no, ya no quiso hablar. Eh, eh, Matthew, um, in order to evaluate patients, when we are uh, performing the hemodialysis, Matthew, uh, do you consider the inferior cava vein, you, you can use it for tailor the, the modialysis doses, or, or what is the, the usefulness of the inferior cava vein when you have the patient in the modialysis? Okay, well, I have to distinguish, since I have a paper coming out a little bit between what our data will show and also what I do intuitively. Right. But, you know, we have data that show that you can use the inferior vena cava diameter and collapsibility to say what patient will tolerate some degree of ultrafiltration. And now that's what we're able to do with our statistical analysis. But I can tell you that you can get a very good idea when you combine it with something like the patient's vital signs of how much volume can they tolerate? Is this somebody where they're going to be easy to ultrafiltrate because they already have a lot intravascular, especially if the blood pressure is good and they don't need vasopressors, versus is this a patient who's edematous and maybe a low blood pressure and you realize, oh man, getting the volume out of them is going to be much more difficult because they're going to need to re-equilibrate constantly. Right. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Well, uh, we have a question from Rogelio Monreal. The, uh, the, él nos pregunta, Rogelio, ¿cuántas líneas B podemos, eh, digamos, que tolerar o se pueden tolerar para calcular el peso seco? Uh, Matthew, he's wondering how, how to use the B lines in the lung in order to calculate the dry weight. Uh, I think, I think that the, the patient is questioning about the usefulness of B lines in order to measure the dry weight in the patients with hemodialysis or something? I think that that's an open question, but I can tell you that actually for looking at the inferior vena cava, some of the oldest literature is from 1983 from a German nephrologist who was trying to establish the dry weight of stable hemodialysis patients by looking at the diameter and collapsibility of the inferior vena cava. Um, as far as the B lines, I don't actually know if that literature exists yet. I think that the lungs are interesting because they tell you sort of about spillover. Um, and the lungs might be a little bit easier in an outpatient hemodialysis unit because I can tell you the tricky thing about inferior vena cava diameter is that there's a difference between looking at the patient who's off of dialysis versus once they're on dialysis and you prime the lines with blood and you have a steal from the heart at maybe 300, 500 mLs per minute. And so remember that that gives systematic bias to a patient who's on dialysis of having a smaller inferior vena cava and maybe larger collapsibility index. So they look more volume depleted than they otherwise would be. But again, remember, you can use that to your advantage. Say you come around on rounds in the ICU and the patient is still, you look, the inferior vena cava is large and there's no collapsibility and they're on dialysis. You say, well, maybe can my nurse extend the treatment by three hours and also increase the ultrafiltration goal? Right. Okay. Very, very well. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, there are some questions in the in the Facebook, but um, a todos nuestros amigos de Facebook, si eh, quieren hacer alguna pregunta en vivo a través de audio, necesitaríamos eh, necesitarían meterse a través del enlace para poderles eh, dar audio. De otra manera, pueden hacer su pregunta directamente en el chat de Facebook también. Eh, hay un médico que también está haciendo otra pregunta. ¿Existen programas de adiestramiento en ultrasonido certificados para nefrólogos? ¿Y existe la posibilidad de realizar alguna certificación en Estados Unidos? Matthew, there are some questions from the same person. The first one is, okay. uh, is there uh, programs uh, of certification or of training specifically directed to uh, nephrologists? Is there some program in maybe in, in, U, in US? This is the, the first questions about the certification and about trainings specifically for nephrologists. 
And the other question is, is there a chance to, to make some certification in the US? Uh, there are two questions from the same person. Okay. Um, it's a little bit tricky. In terms of formal certification, the intensivists who do critical care can do a certification under their license, um, but that involves doing very general ultrasounds as well, like liver and gallbladder, looking for cholecystitis, you know, many things that you don't need as a nephrologist. And that's probably above what anybody's going to do. For a nephrologist in the United States, it's kind of, it's, the bar is low and it's kind of easy, but it's limited in a way too. All that Nephrology Society cares about right now in terms of certification is looking at kidneys and bladders. And so you can get certified for doing that, but there's no certification at all for doing volume assessment or things like that using the ultrasound. Okay, okay, thank you, Matthew. Eh, bueno, eh, no sé si existiera alguna otra pregunta. Parece que, parece que no en, en Facebook eh, tampoco. Well, uh, Matthew, uh, what is uh, your recommendation, Matthew, for the nephrologists across Latin America? Because I think there are several, and there are a lot of nephrologists uh, currently interest, interested in, in this, uh, in, as, as you can see, in learning this uh, powerful tool. What, what is your recommendation for all of them, for all nephrologists across Latin America, uh, Matthew? I tell you what, shortly after this, I'll upload a list of kind of links that I know of different conferences that they do have. What I recommend that you do in general, though, is take one person from the practice that is going to be the most enthusiastic about learning, send them to get trained, and then let them come back and teach everyone else in the group how to do it. Because you need to have somebody to master it. And the important thing is that somebody needs to learn this who's going to do consistently. Sort of the first challenge to get over is you have to get good enough at a technique that you know that you can recognize when you're doing it right. So you can say, I trust that result, I know that I did it properly, or it doesn't look right, I know I can't trust this one at least. So once you can get to that point, you can sort of self-correct and you can continue looking at patients on your own. But you have to keep doing it. What I've heard from many people at different academic centers from around the United States is, oh yeah, we, we went to a conference a couple of times, we tried it, the problem was that everybody got a different result when they did it, and so we kind of stopped using it. You know, you have to get somebody who's good enough that they can supervise the others. It's like any technique, like cardiac auscultation, for example. You know, it's difficult to do, it's subtle, but you learn it, and then you have a physical exam technique. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Well, there are uh, la, uh, one last question in the Facebook chat. Uh, Jose Manuel Vázquez está preguntando qué tan adecuado sería la monitorización del índice cardíaco, del, del gasto cardíaco por flujo carotidio, específicamente en los pacientes con falla renal. Matthew, uh, his question is about the evaluation or the assessment of cardiac output by using the carotid flow instead of the traditional five-chamber five chamber view in patients with uh, uh, renal failure. What's your opinion about using this specific? Well, there's some data actually that suggests that there is a very excellent um, way to monitor cardiac output. It may not be quite as good as looking at the VTI, but it's, um, sorry, the v velocity time index, a way of sort of looking at the area of the ventri left ventricle over time. It's much less technical than that. And so this is a study that they did actually in the Scandinavian Journal of Anesthesiology. And it's kind of interesting because they publish it with all these caveats that say that this data is just considered statistically significant, but not good enough for our clinical purposes. For, but this is actually excellent statistical data. And so I think that this is a very promising uh, method for measuring cardiac output. Exactly. Thank you, Matthew. Or something that's at least directly proportional to cardiac output. Right. Thank you, Matthew. And, and it's very, very practical. Okay. Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, well, apparently there are no more questions. Uh, bueno, pues parece que ya no hay más, más preguntas. Le agradecemos al doctor Matthew el habernos dado esta. Ah, bueno, parece que hay, hay otro, otra pregunta. One, one uh, okay. more questions, Matthew. Sorry. El doctor Quetzalcoal. Eh, le voy a dar audio al doctor Quetzalcoal. Déjame ver. Aquí está. Eh, perfecto, Quetzal, Coat. Quetzal eh, ya puedes hablar, Quetzal, si quieres, eh, puedes utilizar el audio en este momento. ¿Me escuchas, Nay? Perfectamente, Quetzal, gracias por okay. estar aquí, gracias. 
Uh, gracias a ti, Juan. Thank you so much, Dr. Matthew. I just want, I have just uh, uh, one question. Uh, we usually in the intensive care unit are pretty concerned about the appearance of acute renal failure in patients with septic shock. In yes. the past, there are a few uh, evaluations through ultrasound as the renal perfusion assessment with the resistive index in patients with, with, with septic shock. The question is that if you have some experience about and how to use it and uh, the reliability of this index uh, trying to diagnose acute renal failure. You know, looking at the resistive index of the renal artery is a very subtle technique. That takes a lot of time and training to master as a skill, much more than what we're describing here. The only experience that I have using it clinically is in looking at renal transplant patients where we didn't really pay much attention to it clinically, to be honest. Um, I have not used that as a way to um, look at a way to diagnose AKI. I'm honestly not terribly familiar with that literature. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Okay, gracias. Bueno, parece que hay otra pregunta eh, del Dr. Hansel Madrigal. Dice, buenas noches. ¿Existe algún curso con certificación en intervencionismo y diagnóstico nefrológico, principalmente con el uso de ultrasonido para seguimiento de fístulas arteriovenosas y e injertos renales? Eh, Matthew, eh, one person is questioning about, is there some course of, with certification in specifically Matthew in interventionists and diagnostics and diagnosis in nephrologic patients mm -hmm. and uh, mainly the use the use of ultrasound in order to, to make a follow-up in, in patients with uh, arterial venous fistulas and renal uh, transplantation. Ooh. I don't know of anything that's, well, one person who does give a course is a man named Charles O'Neill at Emory in Atlanta, Georgia. And I have actually taken that course, it's excellent. I've done the weekend course and they go through kind of, they do, you know, take you through looking at fistulas, but all you're getting is sort of qualitative things. You might be able to do like recognize a pseudoaneurysm. It might be useful to say, what is the diameter of a young fistula? Is it ready to be cannulated yet? You might even teach the text to be able to cannulate under ultrasound guidance if it's a difficult fistula. These skills sort of exist, but how to pick them up, it's all scattered in different places right now. Okay, Matthew. Okay, thank you so much. Eh, bueno, parece ser que ya no hay otra pregunta. Quetzal, ¿quieres eh, hacer alguna pregunta más? Eh, si no, eh, bueno, pues parece que, que ya no. Eh, bueno, pues le agradecemos al doctor Mati nuevamente el haber el estado con nosotros. Como ustedes pueden ver, nos ha dado una excelente charla sobre cómo el nefrólogo puede utilizar en el punto de atención el ultrasonido. Es, me parece extraordinaria la, la diapositiva donde habla sobre la utilidad en los pacientes con hiperbolemia, hiperbolemia, diferenciar los tipos de, de falla renal, hablando de, también de, la, de pacientes con hiponatremia, hipernatremia, darse una idea con ultrasonido de la, de la posible causa y sobre todo guiar el volumen, en, eh, la administración de volumen en los pacientes con, con hemodiálisis. Entonces ha sido verdaderamente interesante esta práctica. Le agradecemos mucho al doctor y desde luego ahora vamos a colocar en el Facebook de la asociación, vamos a colocar, si el doctor nos permite, su correo electrónico para que en algún momento si gustan hacerle alguna otra pregunta, quieren compartirle algún caso, si quieren eh, eh, sobre todo tener más comentarios sobre, sobre esta misma plática, desde luego lo pueden hacer. Y también vamos a subir el link del artículo en el cual está basada esta, esta charla. Así que, bueno, pues, les agradecemos a todos. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for accepting this invitation. We are honored. Thank you for, for being part of this webinar. It's a, a very nice experience. Thank you for sharing all your knowledge about this topic. And we are really, really very, very happy for, for being here with you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, do you want to say something for the Mexican audience and Latin American audience? Um, pues el gusto es mío. Uh, muchas gracias por uh, permitirme que uh, hablar con ustedes sobre estos temas. Uh, mucho gusto. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, can, can we place your your email in the Facebook site if if they want if they 
have uh, some questions and they want to, to write uh, by email some questions, can we place your, your email in the Facebook site? That would be my pleasure. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Bueno, pues muchas gracias a todos. Les agradecemos al haber estado con nosotros en este webinario. Eh, un saludo a toda Latinoamérica, a todo México. Gracias por estar aquí y nos vemos próximamente en nuestras próximas sesiones en línea. Eh, desde luego también están invitados a todos nuestros cursos que hacemos periódicamente en nuestra asociación con nuestra sede en Guadalajara, Jalisco. Muchas gracias a todos. Y buenas noches. Gracias por, por acompañarnos. Thank you so much, Matthew. See, uh, see you soon and good night for you, Matthew. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to finish the, the session. Thank you, Matthew. Bye. Bye.